وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد مرحبا بكم ايها الاخوه الاحبه والاخوات الفاضلات في مسجد دار القران في مدينه شيكاغو الامريكيه وكذلك الاخوه والاخوات على شبكه الانترنت في هذه العشيه المباركه عشيه يوم السبت العاشر من شهر القعده سنه سبع وثلاثين واربعمائه والف من الهجره الموافق اليوم الثاني الثالث عشر من شهر اغسطس ال لسنة ستة عشر والفين من التاريخ الميلادي وكنا قد تكلمنا في المجلس السابق أو في المجالس السابقة بالأمس عن رسالة الإيمان السيوطي الأربعون حديثا من رواية مالك عن نافع عن ابن عمر والتي تعرف في سلسلة الذهب تكلمنا عن الإمام السلوطي تكلمنا عن الإسناد وعن إسنادنا إلى الإمام السلوطي وإسناد الإمام السلوطي إلى الإمام مالك وإسناد الإمام مالك إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في هذه الاحاديث الاربعين الصحيحه المسنده باحلى واعلى اسناد وتكلمنا عن اسباب اختيارنا لهذه الرساله وقرانا منها سبعه احاديث بينا من خلالها كثيرا من الاحكام الشرعية الفقهية ومسائل متعلقة بكثير من العلوم الشرعية في حين واليوم نكمل إن شاء الله ما يتيسر من هذه الأحاديث الأربعين و نبدأ بالحديث الثاني لكن بعد أن نترجم أخونا أبو عبد الله هذه المقدمة التي أنا استرسلت فيها ناسيا أو غافلا عن الترجمة الحقيقة تفضل يا سيدي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما فإنه من يرد الله به خيرا يفقه في الدين So we started yesterday by the will and tawfiq and taysir of Allah Azza wa Jal the explanation of this series of 40 hadith that Al-Imam Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti rahimahullah ta'ala collected which are specific ahadith that are known by the golden senad, which means that they are some of the most trustworthy men of, you know, in the chain. And they go all the way back to uh, Imam Malik, Imam Madina to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who narrated them from Nafi', who is the servant of Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma from Abdullah ibn Umar from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I think we covered six ahadith yesterday or seven ahadith inshallah we're going to continue and one of the reasons that the Shaykh mentioned that he chose those specific 40 or selection of 40 hadith is that they are relatively short few words but contain a lot of knowledge that we're hoping that we will benefit from. Also, 
Shaykh Barakallahu Fi, he has an ijaza with a connected senate all the way to Imam Suyuti and then all the way to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And yesterday he told us the chain of mashayikh or shuyukh that he took from and who they took from in a connected chain of man all the way to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So today, inshallah, we're going to continue with the next hadith. We'll start with the third hadith, where the Imam al به أي الإسناد الأول الذي قرأناه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إذا جاء أحدكم الجمعة فليختسل. The eighth hadith. And I'm sorry, just let me pull it up. So the eighth hadith, which is where we reached last night, is with the same sanad, the sanad that uh, Shaykh Barakallah fi mentioned in details, uh, st- stage by stage, all the men in the sanad, by the same sanad, which goes all the way to Abdullah ibn Umar, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, and Rasul, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, anyone who is attending the Friday prayer, Jumu'ah, should take a ghusl. وفي هذا الحديث يا اخواني الكرام بيان حكم غسل الجمعة الذي بينه حديث آخر وهو قوله عليه الصلاة والسلام غسل الجمعة واجب على كل محتمل. This hadith shows and indicates the ruling on taking a ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah, which also is identified or, or clarified in another hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the ghusl for the prayer for Yom al-Jumu'ah, for the Jumu'ah prayer, is wajib on every person who is in a state of janaba. غسل الجمعة واجب على كل محتل. نعم. أنا ما ذكرت الجنازة فكيف أتبت بها؟ آه نعم عفوا محتل المحتل اللي هو على كل محتل أي على كل بالغ. نعم بالغ عفوا. نعم. The hadith. Uh, I'm sorry. The Sheikh Barak Allah fee corrected me. The ghusl is on يوم الجمعة is واجب on every person who reached the uh, age of puberty. المحترم هو الذي بلغ ومن العجائب الشرعية طبعا أن السبكي الذي كان يعاصر شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية كان عالم من علماء المسلمين مشهور يعني الذي يضع رأسه في رأس ابن تيمية يعني له مكانته وكان له ولد وهذا الولد صار عالما كبيرا بعد ابيه ايضا صاحب كتاب طبقات الشافعيه الابن الصبك الابن ذهب ابوه به الى الحج من باب حج الغلام ف لأنه يعني باتفاق أهل العلم يجوز حج الغلام مع أبي رأفعت امرأة صبيا فقال فيها رسول الله لهذا حج قال نعم ولك أجر فالسبكي الأب أخذ السبكي الإبن وهو صغير لم يبلغ الحلم الحلم في ذي الحليفة حين أرادوا أن يحرموا احتلم الولد فأحرم بحجة الإسلام لأنه يعني الآن محترم فالاحتلام عادة يكون في الحادية عشرة فما بعد حادية عشرة ثلاثة عشرة بالنسبة لبلادنا بعض البلدان يتأخر والنساء قد تحترم قبل الحادية عشرة نعم تفضل 
The Sheikh is mentioning that the Imam al Subki, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, who is a great scholar, he said that he is on the same level of Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. So he was a great scholar and authored many, many books. He had a son. And even that son obviously became also likewise a great scholar. So both the father and the son were both great scholars of Islam. And the son, the scholar, the Subki, the son, uh, he authored a book called Tabaqat al-Shafi'iyya that contains Madhab al-Imam al-Shafi'i. Tabaqat, Tabaqat, Tarajim al-Ulema al-Shafi'i. That contains biography of all the scholars of Madhab al-Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala. The father mentioned that he once went for Hajj and he took the son with him, even when he was too young. He would, he, at that time, he didn't reach the uh, age of puberty. And the Sheikh also uh, noted on the side that uh, it is permissible to take the son, even when they are too young, for Hajj. And uh, he mentioned the mother at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, who raised her very young son. And she said, Does, is, can he perform Hajj? And he said, yes, alayhi salatu was salam. And he said, yes, alayhi salatu was salam. And, you, and for the mother, she will get reward for it. So uh, Imam al-Sukki, he took his son, and when they reached Dhul Hulayfa, where, where, which is the Miqat, where they would you know, uh, make ihram and wear the ihram, the, the son uh, re, uh, just became, or, or reached the age of puberty, or became an uh, adult person who is responsible and mukallaf. Uh, and uh, the Sheikh also mentioned that uh, you know that the boy uh, can become or can reach the age of puberty as early as or as young as 11 years and some people obviously uh, they reach the puberty at a, at a later stage and for the girls they can have even reach it you know ahead of time or even uh, at, at a, a younger age than 11 years <laughs> دين السبكي هو الولد الذي احتلب اسمه محمد تاج الدين محمد ابن علي السبكي والوالد هو تقي الدين مثل شيخ الإسلام كان يقال له تقي الدين وهذا له تقي الدين تقي الدين علي ابن عبد الكافي السبكي فالولد يلقب بتاج الدين والابن والاب يلقب بتقي الدين الولد اسمه محمد والوالد اسمه علي فعلي ابن عبد الكافي السبكي اخذ ولده تاج الدين محمد ابن علي ابن عبد الكافي السبكي فاختلم في ذو الحليفة فاحرم بحجة الاسلام تفضل ذا شيخ نوت نوت ذات ذا فاذر Imam al-Subki, the father, is called Taqi al-Din al-Subki. So that, you know, when, if you do ever research online, you can differentiate between the two. And the son that we were talking about is uh, called Taj al-Din Muhammad al-Subki, who is the son, also a scholar. And this is the person that, or this is the son that his father took for Hajj, and like I said, uh, reached the age of puberty. Uh, exactly at Al-Miqat, where uh, they uh, would uh, make ihram or would start uh, wear the ihram. And, you know, since he re reached the age of puberty, then he actually made the intention or made uh, the uh, ihram with the hijjah of Islam, because now he became a balagh at the age of puberty. So his hajj is counted as the fard hajj that every Muslim should do once in a lifetime. Okay. <laughs> غسل الجمعة واجب على كل مسلم قال ما تركت الغسل بعد ذلك سفرا ولا حضرا ولا صيفا ولا شتاء. So 
based on this hadith, Ghusl al Jumu'ah, whoever uh, is attending the Friday should take a bath. Uh, the Shaykh noted that Imam al Shafi'i did not, his opinion was not that Ghusl on the Yawm al Jumu'ah is a wajib. And then Imam al Shafi'i he said, until I read the hadith that the ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah is a wajib on every person who reached the age of puberty. He said, after I read that hadith, I never missed the ghusl, doing the ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah, whether I was in town or whether I was journeying during winter or during summer, I never missed ma- making ghusl. What well, hadith that came in the day of Jumu'ah and the Sheikh is saying that there are many, many ahadith that talks about the virtue and the reward that is attached to making ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah. <laughs> بكل خطوة صيام سنة وقيام هذا حديث عظيم نعم بكل خطوة كان له صيام سنة وقيام The Sheikh said one of the ahadith, uh, we said many ahadith, uh, there are many ahadith that talks about the virtue of uh, take, making ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah. One of them is a long hadith that part of which says whoever make a ghusl Right and you know come early to the uh, masjid and come close to the mimbar and you would, uh, closer to the imam and he would pay attention to the khutbah then for every step right along the way uh, the reward is as if he actually uh, fasted for a whole year and made qiyam in that year for every step. وقد يستغرب الإنسان يعني في كل خطبة صيام سنة وقيامها وزيادة في آخر الحديث قال وذلك على الله يسير وذلك على الله يسير نعم The Shaykh is saying that obviously uh, you know sometimes when you read this subhanallah for every step as if you actually the reward is like as if you fasted for the whole year and made qiyam every night of that year it sounds like a great reward right a huge reward for something very simple just for every step and Allah and the Shaykh is saying that at the end of that hadith, you know, just to show anybody who is wondering how come for every step, that's a lot. It says that Rasulullah is saying, and this is for Allah easy. Yani Allah will reward so much great reward, and it's easy for Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the companions you use actually to blame one another for for the they blame the person who doesn't make ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah. قال والله يا أمير المؤمنين ما هي إلا أن سمعت الأذان فتوضأت وأتيت فقال عمر والوضوء أيضا وتعلم أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يقول إذا جاء أحدكم الجمعة فليختسر هذا الحديث الذي نحن بصدده and he said in the bo- in both Sahih, Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, there is a hadith uh, where a man came into the masjid when Umar ibn al-Khattabi radiallahu anhu was giving the khutbah. And another narration, it is it mentions that Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was the person who entered the masjid while Umar ibn al-Khattab was giving the khutbah. And he asked him, which day is this? And he said, uh, Wallahi, I didn't realize it was Friday until I heard the adhan. And then I realized it was uh, Friday, so I made the wudu and then I came. And then, Nihat al Hadith, Shaykh Ba'al Ba'al Wudu. Qal wal wudu aydan, wa ta'alamu anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qal idha jaa'a alakum al-jum'a fa'l-yaqtis. 
صار ما فهمت شو يعني وضوء ايضا يعني, يعني انت تاخرت عن الجمعه وايضا ما ما اغتسلت؟ اي نعم نعم so يعني انكر عليه التاخر وانكر عليه عدم الاغتسال اي نعم so when you know it could have been Uthman or it could be another Sahabi when he said I just realized when I heard Adam so I made quickly uh, 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 wudu and I came to the masjid which means that he didn't make ghusl so Umar ibn Khattab he said and you even uh, you're coming late and you didn't make ghusl and, and, and then he mentioned the, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that uh, he should make ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah والخلاصة يا إخواني أن غسل الجمعة واجب لا تفرط فيه. So the summary, right, to sum it up all this discussion is that غسل الجمعة is a واجب and we should be very careful to make sure that we make غسل on the day of جمعة and not miss it. ننتقل إلى الحديث التالي وهو الحديث التاسع قال وبه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رأى غساقا في جار القبلة فحكم ثم أقبل على الناس. فقال إذا كان أحدكم يصلي فلا يبسق قبل وجهه فإن الله تبارك وتعالى قبل وجهه إذا صلى. So the ninth hadith is with the same sanad again uh, that the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم saw a spittle on the wall of Kaaba. You know somebody spitted on uh, the wall of Kaaba. So he عليه الصلاة والسلام scratched it away. With his, you know, himself, and, and then turned to the people and said, "When any one of you prays, he must not spit in front of him, for Allah is in front of him when he is engaged in prayer." وفي هذا الحديث حرمة البساق تجاه القبلة. In this hadith, there is an indication that it is forbidden to spit in the direction of qibla. والراجح من أقوال أهل العلم أن المساق تجاه القبلة سواء في الصلاة أو خارج الصلاة محرم. And the vast majority of the scholars are with the opinion that spitting in the direction of qibla, whether in prayer or outside of prayer, is forbidden. ولا يلزم من قوله عليه الصلاة والسلام إذا كان أحدكم يصلي أن هذا مقيد بالصلاة. And the fact that in this hadith, Rasulullah restricted it to only while you're praying doesn't necessarily mean that it is only forbidden while praying. فإذا كان في الصلاة تلتفت قليلا وتبتعد عن القبلة فخارج الصلاة أولى أن تبتعد عن القبلة. For if it is forbidden, for if it is forbidden based on this hadith, if it is forbidden to spit in the direction of qibla while praying, and as Sheikh indicated that in another hadith, there is the guidance that you should actually turn a little bit left and spit if you should spit, uh, and kind of you know uh, divert from the direction of qibla. Then it goes without saying that it is easier, and there is absolutely no burden doing that outside of the prayer. When it is, it is e- so so much easier to actually divert from the direction of qibla and spit. وفي هذا الحديث يتبين لنا معنى قول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من رأى منكم منكرا فليغيره بيده. فالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فسر لنا هذا الحديث بنفسه فغير هذا المنكر بيده. In this hadith is a practice of the great other hadith which where Rasulullah said whoever sees something that is evil if you see something that is evil or wrong then you should try to change it with your own hand if you can right in this hadith Rasulullah actually practiced that uh, you know forbidding evil by actually removing that spit from the wall of Kaaba himself, right? He, he removed it with his own hands. And if removing the harm from the road that people walk in is a sadaqah, is a uh, uh, charity, 
then in removing the spit from the wall of the Kaaba is even a greater charity. وفي هذا الحديث أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم حين حكى هذا المساق جاء بالطيب بخنوق أي بطيب ووضعه مكانه فهو غير المنكر وجاء بالمعروف الطيب ووضعه مكانه And then in the hadith it says that after Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم removed that spittle from the wall of uh, the Kaaba which is removing the evil then he brought Uh, some uh, good smell in, or, or otter and he put it on the, on the wall which is obviously it's something that is good which is like ma'roof right so he removed the evil and put ma'roof instead good instead وفي هذا الحديث إثبات الجهة لله تبارك وتعالى في هذا الحديث إثبات الجهة الحين هناك بعض الناس ينفون الجهة لله عز وجل يلفون الجهة لله في هذا الحديث في إثبات الجهة تفضل In this hadith also the Sheikh is saying that there is, an, there is uh, evidence that you can show direction toward Allah Azza wa Jalla because it said that you know when you actually uh, pray and you must not spit in front of you because Allah is in front of you Some people, Sheikh is, is, is cautioning that some people obviously deny that there is no, absolutely no direction to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah is not in any direction. But in this hadith, there is a proof that you can say, and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, He is in front of you. Al Jiha wal Makan wa Nahu Hada min ma yusbat lillah wa yunfa anhu. Qala ulama'una wa ala ra'ashim Sheikh wa Thaymin rahmatullahi alayhi. كان يقول مثل هذه الأشياء لا نثبتها مطلقا ولا ننفيها مطلقا لا نثبتها مطلقا ولا ننفيها مطلقا نقول لمن أثبتها ما الذي تقصده بالجهة تفضل Now putting some more details about the direction what do we mean by that and the, and the sheikh directed that uh, the great scholars always say that the direction is one of the Uh, topics that we don't confirm absolutely and we don't deny absolutely in general meaning. So if somebody says, you know, this is direction of, toward Allah, we ask him, what do you mean? Because when we say that Allah is in front of you, doesn't mean that he is physically in front of you. That's not the meaning what we're saying. But this is toward Allah Azza wa Jalla, in the direction of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So we have to be very careful about what is the meaning, what we mean by that. But that كان يقصد المعنى الصحيح أن الله عز وجل كما في قوله فأينما تولوا فثم وجه الله لأن أصحاب العقيدة والإمام الطحابي رحمه الله تعالى قال ولا تحويه الجهات الست أي الفوق والتحت والأمام والخلف واليمين واليسار هذه الجهات الست قال ولا تحويه الجهات الست كسائر المحدثات فهذا النفي قد يتوهم منه بعض الناس أن الله ليس في جهة وهذا خطأ الله عز وجل قال فأينما تولوا فثم وجه الله فكيف ليس في جهة فإن كان يقصد أنه محصور في جهة بعينها فهذا خطأ والله عز وجل لا يحصر وإن كان يقصد أن الله عز وجل حيثما توجهت تجده تجاهك كما في الحديث الآخر فإن الله سبحانه وتعالى كذلك فالله أينما توجهت تجده تجاهك يعني ليس إذا قلنا أنه في جهة القبلة سبحانه وتعالى لا يعني هذا أنه ليس فوقا أو ليس عن أيماننا أو ليس عن شمائلنا أو ليس من خلفنا بالإحاطة والله من ورائهم محيط وراء والخلف جهة والله من ورائهم محيط لكن ما ثبتت في أي لفظة من ألفاظ القرآن أو الحديث ثبوت السفلية لله عز وجل 
فنحن نقول الله امامنا الله وراءنا الله ايماننا الله يسارنا شمائلنا الله فوقنا لكن لا نقول الله تحتنا لان هذه لم تثبت وغيرها ثبت اللهم انك انت الاول ليس قبلك شيء وانت الاخر ليس بعدك شيء وانت الظاهر ليس فوقك شيء وانت الباطن ليس دونك شيء لا نقول انت الباطن ليس تحتك شيء فكلنا تحته وكل المخلوقات تحته فالله تبارك وتعالى لا تحده جهه فاذا نفينا الجهه ننفي كثير من الايات يعلم ما بين ايديهم وما خلفهم والله من ورائهم محيط فثم وجه الله فهذه ثبتت بصريح القران وبصريح السنه ففي هذا الحديث اثبات لصفه الجهه بالمعنى الصحيح لا بالمعنى المحرف ومن صفات اهل الحديث انهم ينفون عنه تحريف الغالي وتاويل الجاهلين وانتحال المبطلين فنفي الجهه او نفي المكان هو من التحريف ومن التاويل الباطل ولذلك احببت ان ابين عن هذه المساله تفضل Uh, adding more details to the discussion about direction, Sheikh Barakallah Fi noted that when we say that uh, direction toward Allah Azza wa Jal, again, there is wrong understanding and there is the right understanding, which is the understanding of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah that goes all the way to the Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Uh, when we say that this is in the direction of Allah Azza wa Jal, it doesn't mean that we are restricting Allah Azza wa Jal in a specific direction. or we're saying that Allah Azza wa Jal exists in that particular area or within a particular uh, you know, space. That is not the meaning that, we're, that we, that the, the, uh, the understanding that we mean in here. And uh, Shaykh Barakallah Fee, he mentioned that all of the scholars of Islam, including the big ones who wrote in the books of Aqidah, for example, Imam Al-Tahawi rahimahullah ta'ala, in his book, he said that Allah, obviously Allah Azza wa Jal is the creator of all this universe, is not restricted. Nothing limits Allah Azza wa Jal or nothing surrounds Allah Azza wa Jal. Tabarakallah. Hasha lillah. But when we say that direction toward Allah Azza wa Jal, we are actually uh, uh, confirming what Allah Azza wa Jal himself mentioned in a lot, of, a lot of ayat. For example, in the ayah that talks about praying, right? In Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah Azza wa Jal said, فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ Right? Wherever you, on, on earth, wherever you turn to, to pray, right? And you go in the direction of Qibla, then you are praying toward Allah Azza wa Jal. That is the, the meaning of the direction, right? And in many other ayat, obviously Allah Azza wa Jal also tells us that He is to our right, and on, on our left, and even from our behind. So there are directions that are attributed to Allah Azza wa Jal, but again, that doesn't mean that He is restricted, Tabaraka wa Taala, in any particular direction or any specific uh, place. But rather that you know this is that Allah Azza wa Jal, that or or we are in the direction of Allah Azza wa Jal. ومن هنا إخوان الكرام نقول إذا كان يحرم أن تبسق في اتجاه القبلة. فأشد حرمة أن تبصق في وجه أخيك كما يفعل بعض الناس قد يبصق في وجه أخيه في وجه زوجته في وجه ولده في وجه غريمه فهذا حرام لأنه إذا كان الجهة البصق في جهتها تحرم فكيف بوجه المؤمن؟ And if it is forbidden, based on this hadith, it is forbidden to spit in the direction of Qibla, then the Shaykh said it is even more uh, forbidden and it is worse of a, of a sin to spit in the face of somebody. You know, for example, a wife or a son or a daughter or a Muslim or somebody else, right? Because then, you know, some people do that, right? Out of anger, they get angry for somebody, they may spit in their face. And you know this is obviously a, 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 an even worse disrespect, and uh, the Sheikh is saying that this is uh, even worse than spitting in the direction of the qibla. كذلك 
من الأدعية التي ندعو بها صبح مساء والتي تثبت الجهة لله عز وجل اللهم احفظني من بين يدي ومن خلفي وعن يميني وعن شمالي ومن فوقي وأعوذ بعظمتك أن أختال من تحتي هذه من أدعية الصباح والمساء فكيف يحفظك الله عز وجل إن لم يكن عن يمينك وعن شمالك ومن خلفك ومن فوقك وحفظه سبحانه وتعالى أيضا وعظمته تحفظك أي صفات حفظه وعظمته تحفظك أيضا أن تختال من تحتك He said uh, also from the uh, ahadith that confirms the direction that we've been talking about is one of the uh, daily dua. You know, we, don't, we know that there are the morning dua and the evening dua that we say uh, to get the uh, protection of Allah Azza wa Jal. For example, when you make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal, that, oh Allah, preserve me and protect me from, within, from between my hands and from my back and from my front, from my right side and from my left side. Right, uh, and Allah Azza wa Jal is obviously surrounding us from all those directions, and He protects us from all directions. So this also again confirms that we attribute direction to Allah Azza wa Jal. We don't limit Him to that direction. ننتقل إلى الحديث العاشر. قال وبه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يصلي قبل الظهر ركعتين، وبعدها ركعتين، وبعد المغرب ركعتين في بيته. وبعد صلاة العشاء ركعتين وكان لا يصلي بعد الجمعة حتى ينصرف فيصلي ركعتين في بيته. The tenth hadith again with the same sanad that we mentioned at the very beginning that Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, used to pray two rak'ah uh, before the zuhr prayer and two rak'ah after it. And he also used to pray two rak'ah after the maghrib prayer at his house. And two rak'ah after Isha prayer. He never prayed after Jumu'ah prayer till he departed from the masjid. And then he would pray two rak'ah at home. هذه الركعات في هذا الحديث حديث ابن عمر لا تعني حصر ركعات الراتبة. فهناك حديث أخرى سنذكرها تدلل أن الحديث هذا لا يراد به الحصر. The, obviously in this hadith there is a mention of the number of raka'at and what we know from other hadith that mentions other number uh, you know dif- dif- uh, uh, differing number of raka'at he's saying that the, the, the number of raka'at that are mentioned in this hadith should not be understood that these are only the numbers of the uh, uh, optional regular Sunnah or Nafi, we call them the Rawatib, which the Rasulullah used to pray them regularly, and there are from the optional prayer. Because we know that another number of rak'at was mentioned, but this is to show the variety, diversity, that he used to pray this and he used to pray other number of rak'at. فسأله أبو أيوب عن ذلك فقال عليه الصلاة والسلام إن أبواب السماء تفتح في هذه الساعة فأحب أن يصعد لي فيها عمل صالح فسأله أبو أيوب يا رسول الله أيفصل بينهن بسلام فقال له فيمكن أن تصلي أربعا تفصل بينهن بالسلام بقوله صلى الله عليه وسلم في الحديث السابق الذي قرأناه أمس صلاة الليل والنهار مثنى مثنى ويمكن أن لا تفصل بينهن بسلام فتصليهن أربعة متصلات بحديث أبي أيوب هذا. In another hadith narrated by Abu Ayyub al-Ansari رضي الله عنه he saw Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم praying four rak'at before Dhuhr prayer. Now in this hadith two rak'at are mentioned. In another hadith, uh, Abu Ayyub, he saw Rasulullah pray four rak'at before Dhuhr prayer. So he asked him about that. 
so Allah, uh, so the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that this is a time which is before Asr, before Dhuhr, is a time when the doors of the sky are open. And he said, I like my good deed to be raised during that time. So Abu Ayyub al Ansari he asked him again. Are they these four rak'at should be split and separated by a salam, meaning two rak'at, two rak'at? And he said no. So meaning that he prayed four rak'at together with only one julus and one salam. But we know also from the previous hadith that we explained earlier in this series of forty hadith, right? Where we, when we saw that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the prayer of the day and night is two rak'at, two rak'at, right? So now we have two ways of doing it. You could. Based on the multiple hadith, you can pray the sunnah before a dhuhr prayer. You can either pray it as four rak'at together, or you can pray two rak'at salam and then two rak'at salam. وقد ثبت أن ابن عمر وأبا ذر من الصحابة وسعيد بن جبير وسعيد بن مسيب والحسن البصري هم اتباع التابعين كانوا يصلون بعد الظهر أربعا أيضا. Also, it is authentically narrated to us from many uh, great Sahaba and some of the uh, Tabi'i, the second generation, that they used to pray four rak'at after Salat al-Dhuhr. This hadith it mentions only two rak'at, but like Ibn Umar and many other Sahaba, they used to pray four rak'at after Salat al-Dhuhr. وكانت أم حبيبة رضي الله تعالى عنها تقول سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من صلى أربعا قبل الظهر. And Um Habiba radiallahu anha wa ardaha, she said she narrated that she heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying, whoever prays four rak'at before dhuhr and four rak'at after dhuhr, then Allah azza wa jal forbade fire on him. وهذا الحديث في اسناده ضعف لكن إذا ما أضفنا إليه فعل الصحابة الذي ذكرنا والتابعين دل على أن أنه يحسن بهذه الآثار عن الصحابة التي صحت عنه. نعم. The Sheikh cautioned that this hadith of Um Habiba that we just mentioned uh, it is kind of a, a weak hadith. It has some weakness in it. Uh, but uh, with taking into account the practice of Sahaba and the Tabi'in that has been authentically narrated to us. We say that this strengthens the degree of the hadith, although it is weak, but it becomes, you know, a better, you know, good hadith uh, and sound hadith if we take into account the practice of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in. وكان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من صلى قبل العصر أربعة رحم الله مرعا صلى قبل العصر أربعة رحم الله مرعا صلى قبل العصر أربعة also, no. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith that may Allah forgive the person who prays four rak'at before asr prayer. وَكَانَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلِيُّهُ سَلَّمْ يَقُولْ بَيْنَ كُلِّ أَذَانَيْنِ صَلَى بَيْنَ كُلِّ أَذَانَيْنِ صَلَى بَيْنَ كُلِّ أَذَانَيْنِ صَلَى أي بين الأذان والإقامة ومعلوم أن أذان العصر تكون بعده الإقامة فكل أربع هذه بين الأذان والإقامة وقد صح فيها كما ذكرنا حديث ابن عمر السابق وقال أهل العلم أيضا الصلاة قبل المغرب ركعتين تدخل في هذا الحديث بين كل أذانين صلاة لمن شاء وكان الصحابة يكثرون أكثرهم يصلي هاتين الركعتين التي بين أذان المغرب وبين إقامة المغرب حتى يخيل للقادم إلى المدينة من الخارج أن صلاة المغرب قد قضيت والناس تصلي السنة من كثرة الذين يصلون الركعتين قبل المغرب. نعم. In another hadith, Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم said that between every adhan and إقامة between every adhan and إقامة is two rak'ah. So Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم legislated or permitted the, pray, the praying two rak'at between every adhan and iqamah of every prayer. And uh, they, uh, the Shaykh also mentioned that they used to uh, 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 always regularly pray those two rak'at between the adhan of maghrib and iqamah salat al-maghrib to the, to the point that uh, a person who is coming to Medina, Shaykh? Medina, no. 
that a person who is coming to Al Madina at the time of Maghrib, right, and so many people are praying the Sunnah, the Sunnah between Al Adhan and Al Iqamah, that they, that they think that they already prayed Salat Al Maghrib and now they're praying only the Sunnah because when you see so many people praying it, you think that they were done and they're just praying Sunnah now. But this is between the Adhan and the Iqamah. أما بالنسبة للمغرب فلا نعلم بعد المغرب حديثا صحيح في أكثر من ركعتين هناك بعض الناس يصلون بين المغرب والعشاء ست ركعات ويسمونها صلاة الأوابين وهذا لا يصح There is the Sheikh is saying that there is absolutely no hadith صحيح that tells us about any sunnah after صلاة المغرب after صلاة بعد صلاة المغرب نعم نعم after صلاة المغرب or after the Sunnah of Salat al-Maghrib. Uh, but, uh, and there are people who pray six rak'at that they call Salat al-Awwabin, and there is no evidence, there is no basis to this, right? Uh, so there is no hadith sahih about that. Salat al-Awwabin mawda'ha fi waqt al-duha, wa laysa bain al-Maghrib wa laysa. And the Shaykh is saying that Salat al-Awwabin is actually mentioned, but the time for it is actually during the time of Salat al-Duha, which is uh, after sunrise by 15-20 minutes, all the way to uh, shortly before Salat al-Duhar, the time of Salat al-Duhar. Well, well, this is where Salat al-Awwabin should be. And the Sunnah of Salat al-Maghrib, which is the two rak'ah after Maghrib, should always be at home, not be prayed at the masjid, but rather you go back home and pray it, um, unless for somebody, with the exception of somebody who is actually staying in the masjid until Isha. So he's not, he's not leaving the masjid, he's not going back home or anywhere, he's staying at the masjid, then he may pray that, but otherwise he should or she should pray it at home. وَكَانَ عُمَرْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَنْهُ يَضْرِبْ مَنْ يُصَلِّ صَلَاةِ الْمَغْرِبِ الصَّلَاةِ السُنَّةِ في المسجد بعد المغرب ويوكل رجال بضرب الذين يصلون في المسجد الركعتين بعد صلاة المغرب. And Umar ibn Khattab رضي الله عنه used to actually beat the person who prays sunnah sunnah of صلاة المغرب in the masjid and he would task certain people to do the same for people for for uh, to those who pray in the masjid and not at home. فبعد المغرب إما أن يذهب إلى بيته فيصلي النافلة هناك وإما أن يرابط في المسجد وإما أن يجلس في مجلس ذكر بين المغرب والإشاء في المسجد وقد صح في ذلك أحاديث ليس هذا مجال ذكره نعم uh, So the Sheikh is saying in summary you should, all, you should either go home and pray the sunnah of المغرب or stay in the masjid until Isha and then pray it over there or you could sit if there is a circle of anim in the masjid or, 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 or you uh, spend you can spend the time with dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal وَبَعْنَ صَلَاةِ الْإِشَاءِ رَكَعَتَيْنِ هَذِهِ الرَّاتِبَةِ وَإِلَّا فَيُصَلَّى بَعْدَ هَاتَيْنَ الرَّكَعَتَيْنِ إِلَى الْفَجْرِ يُمْكِنْ أَنْ يُصَلِّي إِحْدَى عَشْرَةَ رَكْعَةً أَوْ ثَلَاثَ عَشْرَةَ رَكْعَةً أو ينقص من ذلك ما شاء فهذه هي التهجد أو قيام الليل أما الركعتين بعد العشاء فهما الراتبة. So the the نافلة that is regular الراتبة is the two ركعة after صلاة العشاء and you can limit your prayer to that or if you want to do تهجد the night prayer which is the optional night prayer. You can uh, do 11 raka'at or up to 13 raka'at, or if you want to do lesser than that, according to what we discussed earlier in the hadith of uh, Salat al-Layq. In this hadith, Rasulullah said, or he was narrated as not praying in the masjid after Salat al Jumu'ah, right, at the end of the hadith. The Shaykh is saying that this is from the practice, this is what Rasulullah used to do. But in another hadith, he said that whoever prays Salat al Jumu'ah, let him pray four raka'at after that sunnah. 
Uh, and we, like we discussed before, his saying, alayhi salatu wassalam, takes higher precedence compared to his deed. Because his deed, it could be that his that, that, that is specific to him. But when he said to pray for rak'at, this is for the whole ummah, no question about it. وحديث أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه الذي ذكرناه كان منكم مصليا بعد الجمعة فليصلي بعدها أربعة أما إن صلى ركعتين فيكون عمل بفعله عليه الصلاة والسلام وإن صلى أربعة فيكون عمل بقوله وقوله مقدم على فعله عددا وعددا و أصلا أو خنقول إيش مقدم على فعله عددا وحكما لأن الحكم في القول مقدم على الفعل عددا وحكما نعم If the person prays two rak'at after salat al-jumu'ah then he is following the practice of Rasulullah sallam, which is in this hadith that we are explaining because he said he would pray two rak'at uh, in, at his home and if he prays four rak'at, then he is following his saying, alayhi salatu wassalam. And again, we repeat and, and, and re-emphasize that his saying, it takes higher precedence compared to his deed. So uh, whatever he says, alayhi salatu wassalam, should take higher precedence based in terms of the basis and the number. So notice, he said four rak'at, and he practiced, he did two rak'at at home, right? So you could do either, but what is better is to actually pray for rak'at because this is what he said alayhi salatu wassalam. فإذا ما أردنا أن نلخص ما قلنا نقول الأتم والأكمل يصلي قبل الظهر أربعة وبعد الظهر أربعة ثمانية وقبل العصر أربعة اثنتا عشر وقبل المغرب اثنتين أربعة عشر وبعد المغرب اثنتين ستة عشر وبعد العشاء ركعتين ثمانية عشر وقبل الفجر ركعتين كم عشرون ركعة هذه الأتم في الرواتب والحديث الذي بين أيدينا ركعتين قبل الظهر وركعتين بعد الظهر أربعة وركعتين بعد المغرب ستة وبعد العشاء اثنتين ثماني وبعد قبل الفجر اثنتين عشرة وهناك حديث آخر من صلى اثنتين عشرة ركعة من غير الفريضة بنى الله له بيتا في الجنة فعندنا عشرة وعندنا ثلاثة عشرة وعندنا عشرون ماذا نسمي هذا على ما أخذنا بالأمس اختلاف تنوع فالنشيط يصلي عشرة والوسط يصلي ثلاثة عشر أربعة عشر والكسول يصلي عشر لكن لا يعني هذا أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان كسولا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يخفف حتى يخفف عن أمته تفضل so to summarize, to sum it up and take you know, the summary from this hadith, we say that based on uh, some of the hadith, we can say the, the complete number of raka'at in terms of sunnah, the regular sunnah, the rawatib, is to say to pray four raka'at before salat al-dhuhr and four raka'at after salat al-dhuhr. That makes eight raka'at. And then four raka'at before dhuhr, uh, asr. Four rak'at before Asr, that becomes 12. Two rak'at after Maghrib, that is 14. Two rak'at after Salat al-Isha, that becomes 16. Four rak'at, four rak'at before dhuhr and four rak'at after, that is eight. Four rak'at before asr, that is twelve. And then two rak'at before maghrib and two rak'at after maghrib, that becomes sixteen. And then two rak'at after salat al-isha, that is eighteen. 
and the two rak'at before Salat al-Fajr, that is 20 rak'at, 20 rak'at from the Sunnah Ratiba. But also based on this hadith that we are explaining, right, uh, it says that he used to pray two rak'at before Asr, uh, before Dhuhr, and two rak'at after Dhuhr, that is four, and two rak'at uh, before uh, uh, after Maghrib, that is six, right? And then uh, with two rak'at uh, after Isha, that is eight, and two rak'at before Fajr, that is ten. So we have we see that there is a you know difference between the two. And then in another yet hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that whoever prays twelve rak'at other than al fard then Allah Azza wa Jal will build a house for him in paradise. Now we see that we have now three numbers, three totals, right? 10, 12, and 20. We say about this, what do we say? Is this contradiction? No. Based on what we said yesterday, this is actually a variation from the, from the aspect of uh, diversity. We have different options. So the chef said, so whoever feels like he's capable and he's, you know, uh, he has all the energy to pray more, let him pray 20. If you don't feel, you feel tired and weak and, you know, you can pray 10. You can settle for 10. If you feel middle ground, you pray 12, the 12 rak'at. ويصلي ثلاث عشرة ركعة من الليل غير الذي سبق ويصلي اثنتي عشرة ركعة من الضحى فهذه خمس وعشرون واثنان وعشرون فتصبح يصبح العدد سبعة وأربعين ركعة نعم Also the sheikh said based on other ahadith you can, you can actually take salat al-nafila which is the optional prayer they can, they can reach the number of raka'at can reach a total of 47 raka'at believe it or not because based on you know the 20 the, tw- the, the 20 count that we mentioned before if you add to that two raka'at between the adhan and iqama of salat al-isha and you can pray up to 13 raka'at during the night prayer and you can also choose to do 13 raka'at uh, for Salat al-Duha, if you do the math, that will add up to 47. ويمكن أن يزيد على ذلك بالوضوء بالطهارة. ففي حديث بلال رضي الله تعالى عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال يا بلال أخبرني بأرجع عمل عملته في الإسلام فإني سمعت دفا عليك بين يدي في الجنة قال ما أحدثت في ساعة من ليل أو نهار إلا توضأت وفي رواية تطهرت وصليت ما شاء الله لي أن أصلي وهذا من التنفل المطلق ممكن أن تتوضأ صلي ركعتين صلي أربعة صلي ستة فتزيد ما شاء الله أن تزيد وما زدت فعند الله عز وجل الأجر أخر وأكبر permitted to pray as many rak'at as you want for Allah Azza wa Jal. And in the hadith, Rasulullah Sallallahu asked Bilal. He saw or he heard the noise of Bilal radiallahu an walking in Jannah. And he said, what, what is the reason for that? And he said, I don't know of any deed aside from whenever I committed hadith, which is the deeds that nullify one's wudu. Right, going to restroom, relieving oneself, passing gas, etc., etc. He said, every time I did that, I would make wudu and then I pray two rakat, or whatever Allah Azza wa Jal gave me tawfiq to pray. So they can add up, and the ajr adds up. And I just realized that I made a mistake when I said about al-duha, twelve rakat, not thirteen. قال وبه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فرض زكاة الفطر من رمضان على الناس صاعا من تمر أو صاعا من شعير على كل حر أو عبد ذكر أو أنثى من المسلمين. The eleventh hadith with the same sanad, uh, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم 
enjoined and yani he ordered to give zakat al-fitr at the end of Ramadan upon the people a sa' Uh, which is a measuring, and we're, I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about that, a saw of dates or a saw of barley upon everyone, free or slave, male or female of the Muslims. And this hadith is a, is, a, is a strong indication that, because Rasulullah Sallallahu said, he enjoined, and he ordered. So we say that Rasulullah Sallallahu orders and legislates exactly like Allah Azza wa legislates. And whatever he ordered, as if Allah Azza wa ordered. وَزَكَاتُ الْفُطْرِ لَيْسَ لَهَا وَقْتٍ إِلَّا آخِرْ رَمَضَانٍ لَيْسَ لَهَا وَقْتٍ إِلَّا آخِرْ رَمَضَانٍ And salat, uh, the zakat al-fitr does not have any time except to say that it should be given toward the end of Ramadan. It contrast that with the regular zakat, right, the, the mandatory zakat on the money and wealth, then the time for that, it could be any time during the, the year, right, whenever the conditions are met in terms of the time condition. يسير قليل بعض العبادات مقيدة بالساعة مثل صلاة الفجر مثلا من طلوع الفجر إلى غروب ش... إلى إلى طلوع الشمس هذا وقت قصير مثل يوم عرفة من صلاة الظهر يوم عرفة إلى طلوع الفجر يوم عشرة الحجة هذا وقت محدود زكاة الفطر أيضا مقيدة بغروب الشمس آخر يوم من رمضان ظهور إلى شوال إلى خروج الإمام لصلاة العيد فهو محدود فمن لم يخرجها قبل خروج الإمام لصلاة العيد أخرجها بعد ذلك في صدقة من الصدقة تفضل So from this we also see that uh, for certain type of عبادات there is a limited time frame for that Some of them are pretty wide open, right? Some of some others are limited in terms of time, and that duration could be short or it could be, you know, a little longer. But it could be very short, uh, or as short as maybe an hour or one and a half hours. Example: Salat al-Fajr, right? Salat al-Fajr has a specific time frame, limited one or one plus hours, uh, and uh, it, they, they, so these ibadat that are limited in terms of time should be done within that allotted time. So for zakat al-fitr, we say that the time for it, we said it is toward the end of Ramadan. More specifically, it should be given after the Maghrib of the last day of Ramadan, when we see the uh, moon of Shawwal, to before the Imam comes out for Salat al-Eid. So this is the time. Sheikh says if somebody gives it afterward, he fails or she fails to give it within that time, if they give it after uh, the Salat al-Eid, then it is a regular The charity, not zakat al-fitr. وكذلك لو أخرجها في رمضان فهي تكون صدقة من الصدقة. Likewise, مرتبطة باسمها بالفطر وليس برمضان. نعم. Likewise, the Sheikh says if the salat, if zakat al-fitr was given sometime during Ramadan, then it is it is not called zakat al-fitr. Again, it's charity, but the the fact that it is called salat zakat al-fitr, it is related to when we break the fast. And it has specific time. وقوله هنا على الناس أي على المسلمين على المؤمنين. فهي ليس مفروض على غير المسلمين والمؤمنين. نعم. He's saying عليه الصلاة والسلام that he enjoyed it on the Muslims. It means that this is a duty upon only the Muslims, not anybody else, right? Only for the Muslims. والصاع أيها الإخوة أربعة أمداد وهو ما يعادل حوالي اثنين كيلو ونصف من القمح. أو من التمر أو من الشعير ويختلف باختلاف المواد يعني التمر الصغير عن التمر الكبير القمح الكبير عن القمح الصغير لكن الصاع هو مكيال وليس وزن ونحن عندنا يعني الصاع وعندنا المد وعندنا الإجازات به فالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فرض صاع وقوله هنا تمر أو شعير 
لا يعني الحصر فكل ما يكون قوتا لاهل البلد يصلح ان يكون زكاة فقط كالارز كالذرة كالبرغل كالفاصوليا اي شيء الناس يتخذونه قوتا يمكن يمكنهم ان يخرجوه زكاة فقط نعم In this hadith also it specifies how much is zakat al-fitr, right? So it is, he enjoyed it, alayhi salatu wa enjoyed it upon the Muslims. So how much do you give zakat al-fitr? This hadith actually specifies that. And he, alayhi salatu wa salam, specified it in terms of sa'ah. And we say that a sa'ah is actually a type of measurement, right? At the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that specifies volume, not weight. So it can vary from one type of food to another, but it specifies a, a volume. And it is equal to what we say four times equal what you can, what a, a standard man, you know, build on, of a man can fit in his, in his both hands. If you put your hands together, whatever you fit, can fill it with, it's called mud, right? When, what you can fill in your both hands is the mud. A sa is four times that. Right? And he allowed alayhi salatu wasalam to be given as a saw of tamar or dates or it could be barley. And the shaykh uh, also explained that the fact that Rasulullah uh, specified certain types of food, this is not to say that it is only restricted to that. But this is just an example. And the scholars have said that it can be of any type of the food of the particular country where you are. So it doesn't have to be specifically from dates or barley. It could be something else. It could be corn. Or it could be rice, right? From whatever people eat in that country, right? But the quantity, it should be uh, the fill of, of your uh, both hands four times that. Uh, approximately, the chef, he gave, the, for example, in today's uh, you know, measurement, if you want to compare, approximately it is, it could be two and a half kilos, for example, of uh, medium-sized dates. وفي هذا الحديث أن زكاة الفطر مقروضة على كل حر وعبد وذكر وأنثى صغير أو كبير على من تجب عليك نفقته يعني العبد زكاة الفطر عليه في مال سيده وكذلك الزوجة في مال زوجها وكذلك الصغير في مال أبيه وهكذا نعم In this hadith also Rasulullah Sallam tells us uh, who do we have to give zakat al-fitr on behalf of who, right? And he said it is on every member of the family who you are required to spend on and to support them financially and feed them. So that covers the, both male and female, you know, the, 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 husband, the wife and, uh, and the uh, children. Uh, also, if they're on, at, at the time they were slaves, yeah, that includes the slave and the, and the free person. Because obviously the master... Is has to spend on, on his slave. So all of them, so you have to give on on behalf of each one of them. Also in the hadith, Rasulullah used the word nas, which is people. Now, if you just take people alone, that could, could mean everybody. Right? But then the end of the hadith uh, clarified it and restricted it to only Muslims. So like we said before, uh, the zakat al-fitr is only due upon the Muslims of the people. زكاة الفطر هي لصنف واحد وهم المساكين كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم هي طهرة للصائم من اللذ والرفث طعمة للمساكين يدخل في المساكين الفقراء فتكون لصنف واحد أو لصنفين بالتبع فالفقير مسكين ولكن المسكين ليس فقيرا فكل فقير مسكين وليس كل مسكين فقيرا الفقير الذي لا يملك شيئا والمسكين الذي يملك ما لا يكفيه فإذا كان المسكين الذي يملك ما لا يكفيه يأخذ من زكاة الفطر 
فمن باب اولى ان يخرج ان ياخذ الفقير الذي لا يملك شيئا من زكاه الفقر. فزكاه الفقر تكون للفقراء والمساكين. المساكين بالنص والفقراء بالتبع. بالاولى من باب الاولى، نعم. Who do we give zakat al-fitr to? Right? Who is the recipient of zakat al-fitr? Sheikh said that it, had, it, can, it should only be given to one group or one type of people. Of people. Contrast that to the uh, zakat, which is the mandatory uh, charity that we have to give. Uh, as uh, mentioned in the ayah, uh, we, there are eight different groups of people that can receive the general zakat or the mandatory zakat. But zakat al-fitr can only be given to one type of people, and that is the group of the needy people. And this uh, tra- literally translates the word masakin, who don't have enough to feed themselves and to support themselves. He said this is uh, specified in the text, but what can be uh, tagged along to it, or what is what would be covered under that as well, are the poor who don't have anything. Right? That goes without saying. Yani if the person who doesn't have enough receives zakat al-fitr, then the person who doesn't have anything, it goes without saying. Right? So these are the people, uh, the needy and the poor, are the ones who receives, uh, entitled to receive zakat al-fitr. وَلَا يُجْزِئُ فِي زَكَاتِ الْفِطْرِ فِي قَوْلِ جَمَهِيرِ أَعْلِ الْعِلْمِ إِخْرَاجُهَا قِيمَةً يعني مقوداً a related matter to this is the vast majority of the scholars say that it is not sufficient. That you say, it is not sufficient to give zakat al fitr as money. Notice that in this hadith it talks about food, right? So is it okay if I give it money? The vast majority of the scholars say it is not sufficient and it doesn't count. لا تصوم حتى تروا الهلال ولا تفطروا حتى تروا فإن هم عليكم فاخذوا له. The 12th hadith uh, with the same sanad also that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned Ramadan and said do not fast unless you see the crescent of Ramadan and do not give up fasting or until you see the crescent of Shawwal but if the sky is overcast then act on estimation, meaning you complete Shaban, uh, Shaban has 30 days. وفي هذا الحديث حرمة الصيام قبل رؤية الهلال وحرمة الإفطار قبل رؤية الهلال والله عز وجل ذكر الأهلة في القرآن فقال ويسألونك عن الأهلة قل هي مواقيت للناس والحبت وقال فمن شهد منكم الشهرة أي شهد منكم إلى الشهر فليصوم وقال ولتكملوا العدة أي عدة الشهر والشهر في أصله أيها الإخوة تسع وعشرون أصل في الشهر 29 فقد يمتد إلى الثلاثين ولكن لا ينقص عن التسعة والعشرين التسعة والعشرين هي الأصل والثلاثين استثناء وأقل من هذا لا يصح وأكثر من هذا في الشهر القمري العربي أيضا لا يصح بينما في الشهور غير العربية بصير الشهر عندهم 31 مثلا نحن الان في اب والشهر الماضي تموز 31 لكن في الشهور العربيه لا يقل عن 29 ولا يزيد عن 30 في غير الشهور العربيه يقل عن 29 شباط كم يكون في الغالب؟ 28 وهناك شهور 31 وهذا بخلاف ما شرعه الله عز وجل للناس ولذلك أوجب علماؤنا العمل بالأشهر العربية دون غيرها وسأحدثكم بقصة بعد أن يترجم أبو عبد الله فضل. In this hadith, Sheikh is saying that it, uh, it indicates uh, that it is forbidden. 
to start the fast, meaning the fast of Ramadan, before actually seeing the crescent. Likewise, in this hadith is, uh, we benefit from it, that it is forbidden to break the fast, meaning end the fasting or during the month of Ramadan, we before seeing the crescent, actually seeing the crescent. And uh, uh, the crescent, as, or the moon, was actually created, Allah Azza wa created it for multiple reasons, including as an as a indication for us when the, uh, the month starts and when the month ends. And Allah Azza wa says in the ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ويسألونك عن الأهلة They ask you, O Muhammad, about the new moons, say they are measurements of time for the people and for Hajj. So we go by seeing the moon when, to tell us when the moon starts and when the moon ends. Now we know in the uh, lunar calendar, that, or the Muslim calendar, Islamic calendar, which is based on the moon, the, the month can be 29 days, which is the base duration of the month, or it could be longer, certain months, and it could go, it go one day extra, right, to 30 days. This is obviously different than the Gregorian calendar where you could have 28 days, you can have 29 days, you can have 30 days, and even 31 days. So it varies widely. But in the Islamic calendar that is based on moon, we only have two options. By principle, the month is 29 days. But at certain months could go one day extra or longer, and that makes them 30 days. And as a benefit, side benefit, Chef uh, mentioned that all the scholars, this is why the scholars have said that it is forbidden to actually follow the Gregorian calendar because they actually, it actually varies in terms, of, in terms of the duration of the month when Allah Azza wa created the month either 29 days or 30 days. Uh, تختلف بالنسبة للأمم ونحن آخر الأمم والله عز وجل هو الذي قوم لنا في كتابه إن عدة الشهور عند الله إثنى عشر شهر في كتاب الله فالشهور محددة من الله والأيام إذا نوجى للصلاة من يوم الجمعة فسعوا إلى ذكر الله من الذين اختلفوا في السبت فذكر الله عز وجل بعض الأيام بعض الشهور والعرب لها تقويمها فتب تقويمنا إلى تقويم أخرى كتقويم تقويم النصارى هذا أو تقويم الأمم الأخرى هذا مخالف لشعر الله مخالف لشعر الله الأصل ولذلك أنا حين بدأت بدأت بذكر تقويم العربي ونحن في العاشر من ذي الفعلة بسنة 37 و 400 من الهجرة لأن هذا واجب فضل شيخ is saying that obviously the different, different nations have different calendars right now we know about the Gregorian calendar uh, I uh, my understanding is that the Jews have their own calendar as well. The Chinese have their own calendar. There is the you know Chinese uh, year or calendar, and they all vary from one another, right? Sheikh is saying that obviously for us, Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who created everything. He created this whole universe. He created the time. He created the month, and he specified them. And he specified how long each month is and the duration of the day. And Allah Azza wa Jal says in in the ayah of uh, Surah. Uh, uh, indeed the number of the month with Allah is 12 months in the register of Allah the day he created the heavens and the earth uh, of these four are sacred so Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us I am the one who specified who created the, the time and I created divided that into 12 months and I specified when the day ends and when the day starts and you know when the month starts so it's not up to us we don't actually the one set when the, 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 the month start and when the month end, but Allah Azza wa Jal. And the Shaykh is saying that is why he always emphasized that we should follow the uh, Islamic calendar or the uh, based on the moon. And that's why when he started this halaqa, he all, yesterday and tonight, and tonight, he started by mentioning the date, the Hijri date, you know, of when this lecture took place.
في هذا الحديث يا اخوان الكرام فقدر له قدره اي القدر الشرعي يعني ما بنصير نقدر نحن من تلقاء انفسنا لانه يعني كما قلنا الشهر اصله 29 او 30 وهو الاستثناء فنقدر له قدره اي 30 دون غيرها نعم So in, in this hadith, Rasulullah if you cannot see the moon, right, then he says, act on estimation. What do we mean by, what did Rasulullah mean by estimation? Is it up to our mind to estimate? The estimation in this hadith, the Shaykh is saying that this is actually the shari estimation, which is what Allah Azza wa Jal taught us and told us about how long the month can be. Like we said, the month in principle is 29 days. And the exception is when certain months, you know, are one day longer and they are 30 days. So obviously, the, 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 you know, the month of uh, Ramadan is no different. It, you know, in principle, it should be 29 days. And if we cannot see before it, it starts or when we are in the month of Ramadan, if we cannot see, then we complete that month as 30 days because there's only one, one of, of either options. It's either 29 or 30. There's no 31, there's no 28. Sheikh is saying since he sees the food coming in and usually when the food uh, comes, the minds go away. They follow where the food goes. He's saying he's going to uh, finish by this hadith and but uh, 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 finish this uh, uh, this talk by mentioning a story to entertain you. في سنة إحدى وتسعين وتسعمائة وألف من تاريخ النصارى هذا الذي كان يوافق السنة الحادية عشرة وأربعمائة وألف من الهجرة. أرسلني شيخنا الشيخ مقبل بن هادي الوادي رحمة الله عليه من اليمن إلى الشام في رسالة خاصة للشيخ الألباني رحمة الله عليه متعلقة في ذاك الوقت بأسامة بن لادن أسامة بن لادن جاء من أفغانستان إلى اليمن وبدأ يسلح قبائل اليمن فانزعج الشيخ مصطفى رحمه الله تعالى وقال لي تذهب الى الشيخ وتقول له اسامه يفعل كذا وكذا فانطلقت فاتصلت بالشيخ شيخنا الامام الالباني ماضي بالقصه ممكن ترجم وتكمل؟ Uh, Sheikh is saying that this is a story that happened back in 1991 according to the Gregorian calendar, which uh, is 1411 Hijri. Uh, he was at the time in Yemen and he was studying with uh, Sheikh Muqbil ibn Hadi al-Wadi'i rahimahullah, one of the great scholars of Hadith and of the Sharia. Uh, he sent him with a letter from Yemen to Sham to deliver that letter to Imam al-Albani rahimahullah ta'ala, again, one of the greatest scholars of hadith of our time, who used to live in Bilad al-Sham. Uh, and that letter had to do with uh, Usama ibn Laden. I think everybody knows who he is, he was. And basically the content of the letter was that Sheikh Muqbil in Yemen was uh, not happy and very displeased with the fact that Osama bin Laden came to Yemen who started to provide you know, weapon and ammunition to the people of Yemen. أهل السنة من هذا الفعل فاتصلت بشيخنا الإمام الألباني رحمة الله عليه وقلت له عندي رسالة مهمة جدا أريد أن أحدثك بها فقال متى ستسافر قلت له سأسافر في نهاية الشهر 
الثامن كان الشهر مثل هذا يعني في نهاية أغسطس أنا طبعا قلت له في نهاية الشهر الثامن وكان الحديث الذي يدور بيننا في شهر محرم من السنة الهجرية فقال لي الشيخ ما شاء الله ستمكث عندنا ثمانية أشهر فقلت له لا يا شيخنا الأسبوع القادم أنا مسافر قال ما أنت تقول في الشهر الثامن قلت يعني الشهر الثامن الذي نحن فيه قال هذا ليس شهرنا هذا ليس شهرنا تفضل So when he called the Sheikh Al-Albani uh, to say that he has a message or a letter for him uh, and when he got to uh, Bilal al-Sham uh, to ask him about so obviously Imam Muqbil, Sheikh Muqbil he was asking Sheikh Al-Albani what with respect to the to what Usama bin Laden was doing is that is it supported in the Sharia? Can he do that? Or is this something wrong? And what is uh, the position of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah with respect, should be with respect to that? Uh, now, when, we, when he met with Shaykh al Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was asking him, When are you going to be traveling back? Right? When are you leaving? He said, Toward the end of the eighth month. Right? And he meant, obviously, August, which is the, the, the same month that we are in. And that was the, at the time that was the month that he traveled to Sham. So Shaykh al and that translated into Muharram, which is the first month of the uh, Islamic calendar. So he said, SubhanAllah, you're going to stay with us eight months? He said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm traveling next week. You know, that's why I said uh, the end of the, the month, the eighth month that we are in. So Shaykh al Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, well, this is not our month. Why are you referring to the eighth month? We are in Muharram, and that is the month that we are in. This is our month. هذا الكلام سنة 1411 والأحداث التي حدثت فيما بعد بسبب أسامة بعد عقود فانزعت جدا قال يسلح قبائل اليمن قلت له نعم هكذا بلغنا قال يسلحهم لمن سيقاتلون من سيقاتلون من من الذي يحيط باليمن؟ انظروا الى بعض النظر. تعرف انتم الخريطه اليمنيه؟ الامن اليمن يحيطها عمان والامارات والسعوديه. فاذا تسلح هؤلاء سيقاتلون من؟ سيقاتلون اما العمانيين واما الاماراتيين وإما السعوديين أو يقاتل بعضهم بعضا ما في غير هذا فقال هذا لا يجوز وهذا خروج على ولاة الأمر الشرعيين فكان نظره بعيدا قبل أن تحدث هذه الخروجات وهذه المصائب التي أصابت الأمة بسبب هذا السفه الذي كان عليه هؤلاء القوم تفضل so what the Sheikh is saying that obviously based on that we should ya khwan, be obviously familiar we should be familiar with the month and the order of those months of the Islamic calendar uh, as a matter of fact you know with the permission of Sheikh I can add to say that wallahi it saddens you that a lot of Muslims let's face it ya khwan, a lot of Muslims youth and adult don't even know the names of the month don't know which months come after which month they don't know the, the sequence They've never heard of Muharram, whatever, right? We don't know, but we know obviously the Gregorian months. So we should definitely be familiar. We should know the names of the month, uh, when the year starts, which month is the first and second, and the order. All of that is very important for every Muslim. 
And then he uh, finished the story by saying that when he delivered and conveyed the, to Sheikh Al-Albani the letter of Sheikh Buqbil and what Osama bin Laden was doing at the time, he was very angry and he dis- disagreed with what he was doing. And he basically questioned what they're going to do with that weapon, right? I mean, Yemen is surrounded by all Muslim countries. So all, who, are the, who will they be fighting with that, uh, with that weapon, with those weapons and with that uh, ammunition, right? So this tells us, and this was actually way before what happened in September 11th. So you could see, subhanAllah, Ahl al-Ilm, the scholars and the people of knowledge, they actually foresee, right, what's going to happen, and they know what's wrong. They can tell based on their knowledge and their... Uh, you know, knowledge in the deen, they know what's wrong and what's right, and they can foresee what's going to happen when they see something wrong, subhanAllah, and that's exactly what happened. Enjoy. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Zakunullah khair ya ikhwan. Inshallah, we will serve right now the dinner, inshallah, the akhawat, uh, the second floor. You could go, inshallah, to the basement. The sisters who are sitting in the second floor in the masjid, you can proceed, inshallah, the backside uh, to the basement, inshallah, that's where you're going to have your dinner. Jazakunullah khairan. Wa inshallah ta'ala, the program will continue after Maghrib, because we have 50 minutes right now from Maghrib time. We finish our dinner and we continue after Maghrib. And the Q&A session will be after Salat al-Isha. Isha, it's 9.30. We pray 9.30 to Salat al-Isha. Zakumullah khair.